For the first time in about two decades, all eight units at Bruce Nuclear are sending power to Ontario's grid. And joining us now with more on this, Duncan Hawthorne. He's the president and CEO of Bruce Power, and we welcome you back to TVO. Evening, Steve. Well, what's the significance of all eight reactors being up and running? Well, obviously for us at this site, it's a massive change in, in the, the fortunes of the, of the utility. We, we, uh, we've been in existence now 12 years, Steve. So when we came there, we had four units on, uh, and there weren't really any plans to restart the other four units. So the last decade or so has been exciting for us. Uh, and of course, the difference here is that we're producing almost 40% of the province's energy from our site. You, are, you alone at Bruce Power are producing 40%. Monday of this week, Monday of this week, we were 45% of the Ontario demand. Hmm. Now, when you say you've been around for 12 years, yeah. Bruce Power's been around longer than that, but as a private, privately operated company, it's 12 years. Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, we took over the site in uh, May 2001. So the, the reality is at that time, there was about 3,000 megawatts in operation, and today we've got 6,300. 6,300 megawatts. Yep. And we use, what, 20, 25,000 on a daily basis? Yeah, and, and our warmest or coldest day. Yeah. Hmm. How many homes are you powering? Well, as I said, we, we, uh, we, we work on average around 35% of the province's demand. So, you know, that's, that's obviously a pretty significant contribution. What did you spend to get all these eight reactors up and running? Well, since we took over the site, we've spent seven billion. So it's not been small. And, and for the last you know, five or six years, that what we've been doing on our site has been North America's largest project. So it's been a busy place. Seven billion. You didn't have seven billion in the bank, I guess, did you? Well, you know, you've got to look to our investors for that, Steve. You know, I don't know if you know the partnership. It's, a, it's an interesting partnership in its own right. We've got Almore's pension plan, which Municipal obviously employees. people recognise mm -hmm. uh, here in Ontario. We have TransCanada pipelines, uh, and we have Cameco Corporation out of Saskatchewan. We also have some investment from our unions. So it's a, it's a very unique public-private partnership in its own right. Government of Ontario got any piece of this anymore at all? Government owned the assets, Steve. That's one of the things I don't think people realise. We took over these assets under a lease arrangement, so the assets are still the provinces. As I said, it's a pretty unique arrangement all round. Did you have to integrate any state-of-the-art new technology to get the four reactors that weren't up and running up and running? Yeah, the reality is that you know people didn't think it would necessarily be possible to refurbish these units in the way that we did, uh, particularly units one and two, which had been shut down for maybe 15, 17 years. Uh, a lot of the equipment, you're really talking about taking the reactors apart. Uh, we had to use lasers, robotics, a lot of new technology, a lot of interesting stuff. That wouldn't have been around maybe 10, 15 years ago? No, I think that's part of the issue. It's about you know taking advantage of the technological advancements, really high precision laser alignment to measure everything and make sure it went back exactly what it should do. You couldn't have done that a decade ago. You mentioned that this was the largest construction project in North America, but how about vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? How does it compare? Well, from a point of view of this type of project, people haven't typically needed to do this. The one thing about the can-do technology is it's possible to do this. Uh, other reactor plants, obviously, the equivalent to this would be building new. And of course, if you go to you know, China or India and places where there's massive expansion, you're going to see you know, mega projects. It's just uh, in North America, this stands out. Uh, anything compared to Arriva or Westinghouse on this scale that they're doing? You know, there are, as I said, there are parts of the world. If you went to United Arab Emirates right now, as an example, the, the Koreans are building a four-unit site now. It'll be a big site. It, it will look like half of the Bruce site, but of course they're starting from sand. So, you know, from the point of view of the challenge, it's a big job. Wouldn't you love to get over there and run that one? I've been over and had a look, Steve. It's tempting. It's, it's <laughs> tempting. But, you know, that, this is an example of people for the first time stepping into a nuclear world, it's a big deal for them. Hmm. How have the local residents in that part of Ontario, Bruce County, responded to the fact that uh, you're up and running again? Well, when you think about the area, if you know the area, it's a small community. You know, either you work on the site or a family member works on the site. And hmm. reality is when a plant was laid up, it had a devastating effect on the local economy. So bringing all these units back, we're a big part of the, the economic fabric. So. You know, there's nothing that, that, that people want more than this job security that's come from that. So it's been a, a good news story all around. We're going to bring up a graphic right now which shows the energy mix in the province of Ontario, the current energy supply. Yeah. And these numbers from the Ontario Energy Board. Let's bring these up if we can. And you'll see nuclear energy, almost 60% of the power in this province comes from nukes, 14 plus from natural gas, almost a quarter from water power, 
alternate sources 3.4 percent coal and oil almost non-existent now uh, we were heavily reliant on it a while ago and now there's almost nothing left do should we worry that we rely on you too much to keep the lights on it's, a, it's an interesting question. The reality is that Ontario has been retooling its supply mix. Where it was obvious, uh, you know, commitment to exit coal. Coal, you know, despite its environmental issues, is an incredibly flexible supply source. So we can't do what coal can do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to find a way to, to provide some dynamic response, and we've done that from our units. But, but the one thing we do is provide reliable power 24-7. You know, when you're starting to talk about uh, flexibility for the interior market needs. You need other things. Uh, and so there can be an over-dependency. You know, I've been a nuclear man all my year, years, but I still say there's only so much you can expect. I think we've got about the right balance now. We're about 50% of the installed capacity. But because we provide a lot of energy, we're about 60% of the energy mix. I wouldn't really advocate going more than that. Really? Because, as I say, the, you've heard me say before, the elephant can't dance. We produce power <laughs> straight line. Uh, and you know, people are looking to do different things now with the supply grid. So we've introduced flexibility with our units. Now we can move around about 2,000 plus megawatts, which is good for this market. Uh, but we're still not as flexible as, as anyone else. Uh, Wind is, of course, pretty unpredictable. So you have to recognize that every technology has some attribute, and getting a balance right is important. Mm. Now, of that 56.9% that we just saw there of nuclear power, Bruce represents what percentage of well, that? Well, right now we are probably half of that with, with the Ontario Power Generation. They, they currently have the Darlington and Pickering units. Of course, mm. the Pickering units are expected to end service and. You know, 2020 or so. So, so that, that would mean that either they are replaced by something else or, uh, you know, other supply sources take that gap. Well, that's a huge question. And 2020 is not that far away, obviously, in your game. So yeah. what are the prospects? Well, the, the, of course, the, the interesting thing is not just that, that the, the units that are currently in the nuclear world all need to be refurbished too as we go forward. So we've obviously done the Bruce A, a units by bringing them back. But over the next decade, Darlington units and our Bruce B units will need to be refurbished. So that's, a, again, your massive engineering project. So, and and that will take place over the next decade. Hmm. I want to ask you about how much stigma you think there still is around nuclear power. Because the reality is, you know, if you ask people what the big nuclear story of the past year or two was, I suspect they're going to say Japan, Fukushima. Uh, of course, Chernobyl was a long time ago, Three Mile Island even longer ago. What precautions do you have in place at Bruce to make sure that none of that happens here? You know, you're right. Chernobyl was a long time ago, three, three mile line longer than that. So the one that is more prescient is, is Fukushima. Uh, people obviously understand that you know, tsunamis and earthquakes are not an everyday occurrence here. But nonetheless, it would be flippant of us to say there weren't lessons in that. So yeah, we have done a, a lot of uh, upgrades, l largely to defend against things that are more reasonable here, like tornadoes or ice storms, uh, which would have the effect of disconnecting us from the supply grid and requiring us to support ourselves. Uh, we've, we've bought new equipment, mobile equipment, that can, that can do things. We've actually even rehearsed that in, a, in an exercise that was done in the fall last year called Huron Challenge, where all of the emergency services were brought in. It was a confidence builder for, for the entire emergency services group, Steve. But the reality is that uh, the, the, and I think Canada can be commended for this. We've been pretty proactive in the international community. We've got a strong regulatory environment. We've got good active operators who, who, who learn from these things. And the truth is that, that nuclear still polls very well. If you poll Ontarians, their support for nuclear, the existing nuclear will be 65, 70 percent. Approval. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the people who oppose can be quite vocal and give the impression of being a higher percentage. But if you poll on the existing nuclear and the case for refurbishment, it polls well. You know, as a politician, you go to the polls every day with those numbers. Yeah, you would take those numbers. Uh, everybody knows Chernobyl was not an atomic energy of Canada type reactor. It was a completely different thing. But Fukushima, we may not be as up on. Uh, are there similarities between the kind of reactors you've got and they had? No, I, I, uh, the way I explain it without getting technical is to say a boiling water reactor, was, was what Fukushima is, is a lot of fuel surrounded by a little bit of reactor. Mm. Uh, 
in our case, we have natural uranium, so we have very little fuel surrounded by a lot of water. So the reactor is more tolerant, uh, less, less energy in the reactor. So the designs are pretty different. Boiling water, as the name would imply, is the water actually boils in the reactor. So if you run short of water, as they did, mm -hmm. it doesn't take very long for the temperature to get to a dangerous level. And we saw what that does to the reactor. Candus don't have those attributes. I probably shouldn't ask you to comment on the competition, but I'm going to anyway. Because you, you kicked the tires on this, and I'm just wondering where you think things are nowadays. Atomic Energy of Canada, of course, I guess a couple of years ago, uh, sold off part of its business, and SNC-Lavalin bought it. You took a look at it, decided ultimately not to bid on it. Where does all that stand today? Well, you're right. SNC-Lavalin took over and created Candu Energy, which is a service provider more than anything else. I think, to be honest, the, the, their, well, their ability to sell the technology internationally it won't be the same without the Government of Canada there, because the other vendors really are governments. Mm -hmm. France, Russia, Korea. So it's really about trying to create a services business. I think they can do that to support the existing can-dos. As the refurbishments go forward, there'll be a need for that capability. So I think there'll be a pretty healthy services business, but I really would doubt their ability to sell can-do technology. And given all of the refurbishing that's going to be necessary in this province, any regrets today that you're not in that? Well, you know, the reality is I, I was keen to try and do it, but it was a defensive strategy more than a growth strategy. It was, here's an essential service provider. We want to make sure it's still there. There's more than one way to do that. We don't have to take equity in it to do that. We can do it through relationships. So I think we can get to the same end without, you know, being part of the ownership. Hmm. Has there been, in your view, as a result of this privatization at ACL, you've got your reactors up and rolling right now, uh, everybody pointed out the, di the differences between how we were doing business here in Ontario versus Japan or Russia or wherever. Uh, where do you think nukes are at right now in terms of the public's consciousness in Ontario? I, I still think there's a public awareness gap. You know, I don't think that people really understand where their power comes from every day. You know, people still refer to it as their hydro bill, and I know a lot of people think Niagara Falls is the place. Uh, but once people understand and they're informed, uh, you know, you just showed a graphic how reliant we are on nuclear. Uh, they understand the price point, which again, people don't really see. Uh, they think if you spent seven billion, the power must be expensive. Uh, and of course it isn't. Yeah, we are the lowest price contract that the Ontario Power Authority have on their books. So there's, a, there's an information gap still. Um, and because of that, there'll be some people that, uh, that don't really understand the true value. If, if we shouldn't call it hydro, what should we call it? Electricity, but Electricity. would be a good number. You know, that's what everyone else calls it anywhere in the world. Uh, they don't call it hydro. That's a legacy of the past. Well, Duncan Hawthorne, you've left quite a legacy at Bruce, and we thank you for coming in to TVO tonight and telling us more about it. Thank you, Steve. That's Duncan Hawthorne, President and CEO, Bruce Power. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.